So I'm going to share with you a framework. And the title of this presentation is The Evolution of Consciousness. But you could just as well call it this, How to Defy Convention and Become Truly Limitless. So first, let me share where I got this framework from. So I teach a course online called Consciousness Engineering. It is, thank you. You guys are in the course, obviously. I believe, now consciousness engineering started because I felt that billions of people today, if you are a human being on planet Earth and you went to school, you got an inadequate education. Nobody taught you how to be a better parent, how to be more conscious, how to exercise and take care of your body, how to contribute to the world, how to dream bigger, how to get rid of all the crap that we get piled on ourselves as children. Consciousness engineering is basically a school, okay? And what happens is I get hundreds of the world's greatest teachers, from billionaires to biohackers to the world's best-selling authors to come and teach their biggest insight, their biggest aha in one hour each. And all we do is every two weeks we release one training. And people who attend Consciousness Engineering say it's one of the most transformational programs they've ever had. And because we want to get this out to millions, we drop the price. It's like 29 bucks a month. So we made it really accessible for all of this wisdom. So thousands of people attend this school every month. Okay. And they have incredible insights. But the thing is, as the host of this school, I also end up getting these incredible insights from the people I talk to. And the last couple of months, I had a number of conversations, trainings with these individuals, Michael Beck Beckwith, Joe Vitale, Emily Fletcher. Yes, give them a round of applause. They are incredible teachers. More on them in a bit. But there was this pattern that started emerging. And I started noticing that there seems to be some sort of a roadmap that people go through as they expand their awareness of who they are. I want to share that roadmap with you. So I believe that there are five levels of evolution of consciousness. Now, a bit of a slide is cut off over there, but you can see level zero is where we start. And we go from zero to one, two, three, four. So level zero goes on to level one, level two, level three, level four. Now, level zero is level zero and not level one because the human, the homo sapien, the human race has since in the last 2000 or so years bypass zero completely. We are now mostly starting off at level one. That's where 95% of humanity is right now, level one. Most of you who are here are at level two or higher, and we'll come to that. But humanity started out at level zero. So let me explain. Level zero is early man. When mankind first separated itself from animal, through the faculty of language, we moved from level zero to level one. So early man, was basically more tribal, more egocentric, to use Ken, Ken, Wilber's, Ken Wilber's definition. It was, about out it was about competing with other men for that bush with the berries, for that animal that you were going to hunt for food. But with the faculty of language, we began to differentiate ourselves from animals, and that's when we got to level one. Level one is when you see an ape can say, and they've studied chimpanzees, and scientists have found this, that chimpanzees can say, watch out, tiger. But early, but as man evolved, man developed language to such a degree where it wasn't just a simple statement. We could say, hey, Bob, don't go to the river. You might get eaten, because I saw a tiger lingering there. But that faculty of language also allowed us to create the cognitive world, meaning religion, mythology, culture, tribes, cultural symbols, that's when mankind moved to level one. But level one didn't just stop at that. In the last 100 years, we've used level one, the cognitive world, to create things such as corporations, meditation, passion-based work, careers, nine to five, mindfulness. All of these exist solely in the cognitive plane. You cannot touch them, but we know what they are because they are ideas that we have in our heads. So. That's when we move to level one, which is more than man. This is where 95% of the human race is today. Now, there are a couple of unique things about level one. Level one is all made up. We made up, our forefathers made it up, and they trained us to take on these constructs. If you ardently believe in your religion, you're at level one. If you believe in nine to five, you believe in corporations, you believe in mindfulness, you're level one. There's no good or bad or judgment in level one. The important thing is we are living in a world of mental constructs. But there are a couple of problems in level one. You see, in level one, 
we tend to be at what some people call the victim stage. Michael Beckwith calls this the victim stage. The victim stage means we live in this world of constructs, but we have forgotten that we can mend, we can fix, we can mold this world. And so rather than go out there and try to change this world, we react like a victim. He said that and it hurt me. My government is keeping me down. The world is like this. And most people live like that. They feel helpless in the face of the, this giant seven billion human being planet that we live on with so much happening all the time. But at a certain point, you start waking up. And when you start waking up, that's when you start getting to level two. I call level two the state of the culture hacker. Because here's what happens at level two. At level two, you start questioning culture. Now, what is culture? Culture, according to Yuval Hariri, who's the historian who wrote the book Sapiens, culture is nothing more than all our human beliefs and all our human rituals and practices coming together. But culture isn't just religion. Culture is our ideas of getting a college degree to be successful. It's our ideas of joining a corporation, of being an entrepreneur. All of these are cognitive concepts which come from culture. But the thing is, when you get to level two, you start developing an idea that culture is an absolute truth. And you can hack it, you can bend it, you can mold it to your own desires. In the words of Steve Jobs, you realize that everything in the world around you was made up by people no smarter than you, and you can change things. And when you get this, said Steve Jobs, you will never be the same again. I love that quote, but that's what's happening at the level of Culture Hacker. Now at Culture Hacker, something interesting begins. The world of questioning. We start questioning. Most people don't question because, you know, when a kid grows up and they start asking their parents, why, 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 why? Most parents will simply say, because I told you so. But, so we tend to kill that ability to question at an early age. But most of you are here because you question. If you're watching this as a video on YouTube, you're curious, you're beginning to question. Congratulations, you are already most likely at level two. So level two is the level of questioning. But something else happens at level two. At level two, not only are you questioning culture, but you begin to see that the world around you is bendable. You don't like the nine to five, great. You become an entrepreneur. Or you start a company with flexi time. You don't like the idea of marriage, great. You come up with your own ideas of how a man and a woman should relate. You don't like the idea of college degree, no problem. You drop out and start your own thing. You begin to, culture, to question the conventions of culture. And this is where an important insight enters your head. Life can happen to you or life can happen from you. When you grasp the idea that life is within your control, that you have the ability to bend reality, you're at level two. Now this is what this AFES was about, teaching you that beliefs are hackable, beliefs are swappable. Now remember, culture is nothing more than beliefs plus rituals. So when you learn that beliefs are not you, beliefs in fact possess you, but those beliefs can be plucked out and replaced with more empowering beliefs. You have started to understand this phrase, that life can happen to you or life can happen from you. You can create life through the process of questioning, of hacking beliefs, and filling your mind with empowering beliefs, not necessarily the beliefs from your parents, your school, your education, your religion, or your culture. You identify the difference between a rule and a brule or a bullshit rule. And you start to see that we are swimming in a sea of bullshit rules that we can choose to question and ignore. Now at this point, something interesting happens. The idea that your thoughts can create your reality. This is not just a mystical statement based on mumbo jumbo or the law of attraction. If you believe in that, that's great. That's a good belief. But you can literally question and shift reality because you can question the cognitive plane. Most of the world we live in right now is nothing more than ideas which may have already hit their expiration date, but which we are still playing with. So now you get to toss out that expired idea out of your refrigerator and put in a fresh one. Now at this point, something interesting happens, right? You're at level two, you're the culture hacker, and you start growing at an accelerated pace when you get to level two. So your growth, if it's like this, when you get to level two, it starts growing like that because you start seeing that the world is under your control, that you can question. And I want to share with you a really important piece of wisdom that I learned 
from Michael Beckwith. So Michael was one of the trainers who came on consciousness engineering, and we had an incredible conversation, and he put on an incredible training that people loved. And in that training, so this is a, just a clip from that training, but he spoke about an idea called Satori versus Kensho, and he said this, right? This is one of the most powerful ideas I've learned. Michael Beckwith said that you can learn and grow in one of two ways. You can grow through Satori moments. Satori moments are moments of sudden awakening. This is when you're meditating, and all of a sudden you have this feeling of connectedness with the entire world. Now, Satori moments are rare. They are, ran they are powerful awakenings, but they are rare. Most people grow through Kensho. Kensho is growth through pain. So someone breaks your heart, and it's painful, but you learn to be more resilient. You learn self-love. You learn how to have a healthier relationship. You end up hospitalized, but you grow through Kensho, and you learn to take better care of your body. You might lose a business. Boom, Kensho hits you. But you learn to invest in your growth, learn new business skills, plan better, and you launch that new business to be successful. So both Satori and Kensho are nothing more than incredible ways for you to grow. But when you understand the idea of Kensho, you know, every time pain hits you, I know that it changed my way of dealing with pain. Every time pain hits me, I'm like, damn, and I curse. But I know that it's just a way to kick my butt, and some great learning is going to come from it. That's an incredible belief to have, the belief that Kensho is really nothing more than a universe's way of pinching you to get you to turn to the right direction. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And then there's Satori. So Satori also is a great way to grow. It's a little bit rare, but it still happens. Now, as you go through enough Kensho and Satori, something interesting happens. You started questioning everything about the world. And when you start questioning everything about the world, including some of the fundamental truths, be an entrepreneur, get a career, you hit level three. Now at level three, in Michael Beckwith's words, something very unique happens. You stop getting obsessed with goals, with even the great goals that society says you need to have. Instead, you become a servant to a higher calling. Those are his words. So let's look at level three. Level three is what I call the state of limitless. And I want to share a really interesting thing that happens at level three. And here I'm going to share from another teacher on consciousness engineering, Joe Vitale. So Joe Vitale went from homeless. He was sleeping in his car. He went from homeless to being the author of 50 books, being in 15 plus movies, and producing 15 music albums. He's one of the most incredible generators of ideas I've ever seen. But Joe Vitale has a really interesting idea and thought on how he's able to produce so much work. He says, at a certain state, he woke up. Now, he didn't use the same languages as Michael Beckwith, but I noticed both these great men were talking about that same expansion of consciousness. Now, Joe Vitale said, inspiration leads to intention. In fact, his exact words were, intention is for wimps. If you think you're simply going to go out there and make a list of all your goals and decide, I'm going to check that off, that's a wimpy way of doing it. He says, at a certain level of waking up, you're tapped in, you're tuned in. You are not separate from life force or the universe or God or whatever you want to call it. You are one with it. And you get inspiration. You get downloads. And these downloads are what design your intention. So you think you came up with a goal to write that book or start that company or serve that course. Bullshit. Someone was speaking to you and planting that in you. And whether you call that life force or universe, you were chosen. And your job is to just take the order and make it happen. So, so the analogy is this, right? And this is another belief that I want to discard. Let me share with you this analogy, the compass and the rocket. Most people set goals, and then they rocket towards those goals. They decide, I'm going to do this and this and this to get to that goal. But when you get to stage three, you don't just think of a goal and rocket towards it. You first tune into an internal compass to find out if you're pointing in the right direction. What if that person you want to be with isn't really the person you're meant to be with? What if that school that you want to get into isn't where you're going to meet your future soulmate or your future business partner? 
What if that trip that you want to take to Brazil isn't going to be the country where you're going to meet that man or woman that you're going to fall in love with, and you should really be going to a different country? What if that business that you want to start is unnecessary? It's going to be evolved to selling craptastic products. But there's something way more important that you need to do for the world. When you get to level three, intuition or inspiration guides your intention. And that was one of the most powerful new beliefs that I developed in the last couple of years. Now, when I started doing that, things changed. Now, I want to share another word of wisdom. This came from Emily Fletcher. So Emily Fletcher is an incredible meditation instructor. She spoke at AFES last year. She has spoken at Harvard Business School, at Google. And Emily shared a really interesting story with me. So she was talking about this idea, that the universe does not play favorites. We're all equal in the eyes of the universe. The universe doesn't play favorites. And she said, she heard the story about Michael Jackson. He would wake up at 3 a.m. and call his agent and go, hey, fireflies, we need to do fireflies. And the agent is like, Michael, it's 3 a.m. Why are you waking me up? And Michael said, no, we, I need to write this song, fireflies. And the agent goes, so write it. Michael goes, no, I need to write it right now because if I don't write it right now, Prince is going to write it. <laughs> what Emily was saying is that the universe doesn't play favorites. It decides that something has to be born in the human scape. You might be the convenient person who has the assets to make it real. You may not realize it, but it realizes you. But if you do not listen to that inspiration, it'll just go, oh, Bob isn't ready. Let me go talk to Sam. So when that inspiration comes, no matter what people say, no matter how crazy it is, you want to listen to it. And if you're at level three, know that you want to start moving towards it. Now, when you do this, your life starts changing. This is when you truly start living a mission-oriented life. And yes, happiness is amazing, but you can get happiness from smoking a joint. Real, real, real. The real goal in life, I believe, is fulfillment. Nothing, 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 nothing makes you as happy when you're living a mission-oriented life, and that mission is designed to push the human race forward. One of my most favorite quotes is, business people do it for the dollars, but real entrepreneurs, they do it to push humanity forward. But you get there when you're listening to that inspiration, the universe picks you, and you're ready to move. So, that's level three. That's where you want to be. Now, Michael Beckwith said something really interesting. You know, I asked him, how can we accelerate people moving to level three? He says, you don't have to. Satori and Kensho will, will take care of that. But here's the important thing. Michael said, when you can see the levels, when you understand the framework, you immediately are giving yourself a way to ascend it faster. So just by understanding this framework, you speed up your evolution from two to three. Now, why is the mission-oriented life important? Well, I spoke about this in my earlier presentation. Missions give us meaning. They give us fulfillment. The Dalai Lama once said, you want to be happy? Learn to make other people happy. Nothing makes you happier than being able to contribute. The mission-oriented life will not just give you meaning because you're contributing to bettering the human race, but it will reward you with so much abundance and so much opportunity that you never dreamed you could live like that. All the greatest entrepreneurs I know are living mission-oriented lives. People like Elon Musk, like Larry Page, like Peter Diamandis. They're doing incredible change in the world, but you don't have to play at their level. You could be running an organic farm. You could be writing a children's storybook. You could be a blogger sharing wisdom with a pool of just a thousand people. But if that is what you feel is your mission-oriented life, that is what is going to give you fulfillment. Now, there's something very imp important on why you want to get there, and we're going to come there in a moment. Mission-oriented life isn't just about fulfillment and bettering the human race. There are four things that happen when you get to this level, and these four things are like magic. We'll talk about them in a moment. But first, let's talk about the final level, the God mind. That is level four. Okay? So level four is a more mysterious level. I had conversations with Ken Wilber, who's America's most cited living philosopher, and Ken Wilber said, today in the world, there may be only four or five people who are functioning at the God mind, only four or five out of billions. At the God mind, you're basically, you basically feel a connection with all life. Now, some of us experience glimpses of it while under certain forms of deep meditation, under certain drugs, 
That works as well. I experienced it briefly in the rainforest in Ecuador with shamans under ayahuasca. But for most of us, it's a single fleeting thing. Many people who experience out-of-body experiences experience that God mind level. And when they come back, they are suddenly at level three and their lives are never the same again. So don't worry about the God mind. We are still experimenting with that. We're still trying to figure out what is this ability, this level, but it is there. Now, at the God mind, the fundamental thing is total connectedness. You start to realize that you are not you. You are almost, I like to use the word, a particle of God or a godical. <laughs> you are nothing more than a godical in a meat body on a giant rock hurling through space, having a ton of fun, an experiment with your godical creation ability. That's what happens when you, when you get to level four. But it also, because you are a godical, you are part of a larger whole, a particle that's part of a larger whole, you tend to be very compassionate towards the human race. You tend to realize that there are no limits, and traditional problems that bug most people just don't, don't burden you because you are so much more. Okay, but again, it's a very, very, very incredible level of connectedness. Most of us experience it in glimpses. Maybe at a certain point, the human race will evolve where we are all living as mini gods in our own conscious kingdom, but that's somewhere in the future. So for now, I want to talk about this state, the state of limitless. Now notice something, right? At state one, you're a victim. At state two, you're a culture hacker. You start to understand that your thoughts can create your reality. You can bend things. You can mold the cognitive plane. At state three, you can mold the cognitive plane, but you are a servant to a higher calling. I compare it this way. At state three, you have a boss. That boss takes care of you. He's going to make pay you well. You're going to get crazy abundance. He's going to clear roadblocks. He's there to listen to you, but you got to take the marching orders. So when you get to state three, you may be an entrepreneur, but you're a very confident entrepreneur because you're not doing it alone. You have a power, a boss that's helping guide you. Now, there are a number of really unique qualities about state three or the state of limitless. I talk, I'm going to be talking a lot about these qualities and the state in my upcoming book, Code to an Extraordinary Mind. But let me sh briefly share them, then we're going to go deep. The first is a sense of connectedness with all life. The second is you're tapped into intuition. The third, inspiration drives your intention. And the fourth, luck is on your side. So let's go deeper, okay? First thing that happens when you get to the state of limitless is you've started questioning all the rules, all the rules or bullshit rules of society. You realize religion is a rule. There are great things about religion, but you can hack religion. You don't just have to be a Catholic or just a Muslim. You can take the best of all the beauty that human spirituality has provided around the world, pluck them together like Lego bricks, create your own religion. You do not have to conform. You also start to realize when you get to state three that the idea of ethnicity or race or nationhood is another bullshit human rule. We are one race, the human race, on one planet. You do not have to conform. When you get to state three, as Ken Wilber says, you have moved from egocentric to ethnocentric to world-centric. You are just as concerned about Syrian refugees as you are about homeless people in your city. You are not just thinking about your own bank account but trying to figure out how can we elevate all people. Now, it doesn't mean that you're giving away your wealth or any of those like other crazy theories about socialists. All it means is that like many of the world's greatest billionaires, like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, you are thinking about how you can use your money and your power for good to uplift humanity. Okay, so the first is the state of connectedness. Now, there's a second thing that happens when you get to this level. And the second thing is intuition. Because you're connected, you're tapped in. Now, what happens when you're tapped in? This is when inspiration flows through you. When I interviewed Joe Vitale, I noticed something really interesting about this man. There was no preparation for the interview. He just flowed, and it was poetic. And I could see how he could write 50 books and produce 15 music albums. He just flowed. And he says, I don't know what I'm going to say. All I know is I have to open the link, and it flows through me. You'll notice many other great people, Lisa Nichols channels, Christy Marie Sheldon channels, I channel, Jeffrey Allen sitting over there channels, this, they're tapped in. You can learn this too. 
great writers, great artists, great musicians, talk about situations where they just seem to channel. Now, we tend to associate this with artists, musicians, but it's also great entrepreneurs. Elon Musk did wake up one night with the mathematical formula in his head on how he could help his rocket be more optimized than the traditional rockets of its time. Many great entrepreneurs wake up with their crazy ideas. I asked Richard Branson once, how do you know which partners to go in business with? He said, well, when I shake someone's hand, I usually get a feeling within 60 seconds. Think about that for a moment. Intuition is what happens when you get to the state. So you're tapped in, right? You're connected. This connect connectedness builds that intuition. This leads to the third quality, inspired action. Intention is for wimps. I stopped having a goal list. What I do is I listen and I get a calling or pulse, an impulse to do certain things. Awesomeness Fest was really one of those things that just kind of came to me as a calling. I never set a goal when I was graduating from college that I would start a giant party slash conference slash really cool people slash Costa Rica beach sand pool whirlpool thingy. <laughs> that, that wasn't it. So inspired action, you get these crazy ideas and, but you, they just feel right. And many great entrepreneurs, I know many great creators, many great employees do this. They get these inspirations. So again, notice it's a pattern. Step one, you're connected. Step two, because you're connected, you're downloading. Step three, because you're downloading, you are taking inspired action. But there's a fourth one. And the fourth quality that happens when you get to the state of limitless is this, luck. I can't explain it. But I believe this is what's going on. Your boss, that higher power, doesn't just give you marching orders. He clears the way. What happens is, if you happen to march in the wrong direction, something will happen. Little Kensho moment, little pinch to just correct you. And if you're marching towards the right calling, everything becomes easy. Life becomes an uphill climb. That's why people who are operating at this state have all the obstacles cleared. And we call them, we use words such as visionary, or lucky, or, you know, they had tons of money, or, you know, they had political connections. Maybe, but I believe the number one thing they had, and all of us can learn this too, is they've elevated their consciousness to a state where they've learned to tap in, to get that calling, and then to trust, to move forward, and to see everything else cleared from their path. Think about moments in your life where everything seems so easy. Think about the state you were in, and you will notice that often when you set out on that journey or that path or that company or that project, could be really small, could be really big, could be something as simple as deciding that you wanted to raise a really beautiful kid and then just becoming a parent, or it could be starting a $100 million business. It will feel like it was a calling. And when obstacles hit you, they rapidly clear. They may be painful for a moment, but they rapidly clear. Luck comes on your side. It feels as if the universe has your back. And this is why you want to get to the state of limitless. First, sense of connectedness. Second, your tapped intuition. Third, inspiration drives your intention. Fourth, luck is on your side. So um, that's what I wanted to share with you. That's where I wanted to give you a sense of where you can go. But it all starts with questioning questioning everything about the world that you have learned is absolutely true, and beginning to go, uh-uh, I make my own rules. Thank you. Woo!